So you had the opportunity near the beginning of the semester to either read a piece defending and promoting science and reason, and kind of a version of what we might call Neoplatonism, written by Bertrand Russell. But instead, you chose, I don't know, what may be the more interesting of the two readings. You chose to read Blaise Pascal. Now, I am no Pascal scholar, but this guy, as far as I can tell, is basically a genius. Blaise Pascal was an influential French thinker, theologian, mathematician, physicist, scientist, you might even call him. Incredibly smart guy, child prodigy, actually, who heavily influenced mathematics, for instance, and I believe optics as well. Although the reading that we're looking at today is not, strictly speaking, all that scientific. Although you might say it is a little bit mathematical, like the theory of utilitarianism that we looked at in our second lecture. The reason why I think it is interesting to look at what Pascal has to say is not only because I think he writes with a lot of feeling and authenticity, you can see him really wrestling with some of the fundamental questions of human life. So it gives us a window into that. It gives us a window into somebody's personal, authentic experience. And I think that that is always useful. But the question that he's considering is also one that I think many people ought to consider in their lives. Because if he is right, This is perhaps the most important question that you can ask yourself. It's a question that has to do with your happiness, your fulfillment, perhaps your eternal fate. That question is, well, how should you live? But more specifically, should you bet or live as if God exists? That is the question that we're going to be discussing today. So, if you could pull up the reading in front of you, Pascal's Wager, that would be great. Otherwise, you can follow along here on the board. But I'd like to just read through this with you all and get some of your thoughts. Try to put yourself into the perspective of somebody who is really, truly wrestling with a question. I'm not sure if you have had this experience or if you have had the particular experience of wondering and, and anxiously trying to figure out if God exists and what that might imply about how you should live your life and what your fate might be after death, whether there is an afterlife. But according to Pascal, this is something that we ought to consider. The issue, however, is that, well, there are a lot of issues, but one of the issues is that the concept of God that we have is not entirely comprehensible or conceivable to us. You'll hear, hear people say nowadays that they believe in God, that they're a Christian, but what Pascal is going to be moving through in these sections is wrestling with not only having faith in God, but understanding how such a being could exist in the first place. So let's go ahead and begin. We'll start in uh, the Pensies, Aphorism 343. Infinity. Nothingness. Our soul has been cast into the body where it finds number, time, and dimension. It reasons thereupon and calls it nature, necessity, and can believe nothing else. So obviously we are embodied beings, right? We find ourselves on this physical plane of material things, atoms, energy, tables, chairs, flesh, desire, so on. Unity added to infinity adds nothing to it, any more than does one foot added to infinite length. 
the finite is annihilated in the presence of the infinite and becomes pure nothingness. So does our mind before God. So does our justice before divine justice. There is not so great a disproportion between human and divine justice as between unity and infinity. But the justice of God must be as vast as his mercy. His justice done upon the reprobate is not so vast as, and should shock us less than, his mercy shown towards the elect. Okay, so he's bringing up another, a number of Christian ideas here. Right? What do we say about the Christian God? Well, according to Christianity, he is all-powerful, all-wise, all-good, and has other positive qualities like this. Right? Omnipresent, you might also say. God is also considered to be perfectly just and righteous, but also perfectly merciful, which may seem to be a contradiction to us. Right? Because anybody who has meditated on this question might ask, well, look, look at how much evil and suffering there is in the world. If God really is all-powerful and all-good, how could he allow such a universe like this to exist? And then if you get further into Christian theology and you start asking questions of free will and are people actually responsible for sinning and being damned, the vast majority of Christians are going to say yes, but if you think more hard about that, you might think, but God is the one who created all this in the first place, and he knew what was going to happen, so isn't he responsible for all of that? Yet Christianity is going to affirm that God is perfectly just, but also perfectly merciful. Does that mean that we do deserve infinite and eternal damnation? because of a single sin in our lives? Does that seem just? But it also doesn't seem just that perhaps if you take on this view of depravity, total depravity, that you are sinful through and through, that you don't deserve any salvation whatsoever. So these are some of the questions that he's wrestling with, right? And if you were raised in a Christian household and you thought about this stuff, you may have also wrestled with them. We know that the infinite exists, he says, but we are ignorant of its nature. Since we know it is false to say that number is finite, it must be true that there is infinity in number. This is something you've heard in your math classes, right? Numbers go on forever, right? But we do not know what it is, this infinity. What is that? We cannot say that it is even or that it is odd, yet it is a number. And every number is either even or odd. This is certainly true of every finite number. So we may perfectly well know that God exists without knowing what he is. Now maybe this seems like a non sequitur to you, but what he's trying to point to here is that we can know that something exists without understanding it or without being able to properly conceive of it. For example, if you are in math classes, you have, will have worked with infinity and infinitesimals. But can you conceive of an infinite thing? What does that even mean? You can't even picture 12,000 things in your mind. right? But we know that using these Numbers works, right? And it leads us to truth of the world. So he's likening the infinity of numbers to God. He's saying, okay, maybe I can't understand God. I can't reconcile all these properties that I think God has together. I can't make sense of it. But I can still know that God exists for some reasons. And we'll talk about a little bit more of those as we go through here. Is there not one substantial truth, seeing that there are so many things which are not truth itself? We know then the existence and nature of the finite, because we too are finite and have extension. Remember, extension means we have volume, we are extended in space. This is one of the concepts we saw in the first unit. 
And we are finite, right? We're not all powerful. We don't know everything. We're limited. We're not right, infinitely vast or intelligent or anything like that. We know the existence of the infinite, but not its nature. For like us, it has extension, but no limits, such as we have. But we know neither the existence nor the nature of God, because he has neither extension or limits. Okay, so now what we've apparently been met with is something of a contradiction. Didn't he just say that God exists, or that we can know that God exists? But now he's saying, but we know neither the existence nor the nature of God? What's going on here? What do you think? Any ideas? Yes? I think maybe he's trying to say that like, we can't have proof that God exists because that would be antithetical to the idea of faith itself. Like, part of the challenge is believing it despite the fact that we don't have evidence. Precisely. Yes, exactly. As we'll see when I go through the PowerPoint here in a little bit, one of the things that Pascal is arguing here is that there is no proof for God's existence. Depending on who you talk to, a lot of people will say, there's a lot of evidence for God's existence. Here, I'll give you all these philosophical arguments, right? Or just look out there. All of that is a testament to perfect beauty and design. Clearly it points to a creator. And then you'll have other people who will say, I don't see any evidence of a creator. What the hell are you talking about? You just have some bias, right? Some prejudice towards believing in this, oh, fairy tale guy in the clouds, right? So he's saying, we don't have any proof that God exists. It doesn't seem like we can use reason to prove that, one way or the other. But if you follow the mystics in the various religions throughout history, so many of them have claimed that while they cannot prove that God exists, they have felt God or they have seen God, right? And so we might bring up the different motions and operations of reason and faith or proof and intuition. These are things that Pascal is kind of wrestling with. But by faith, we know his existence, he says. In the light of glory, we shall know his nature. So, not on earth, but maybe after our death. I have already shown that there is nothing to prevent our knowing the existence of a thing without knowing its nature. As he showed with the number infinity, right? We know that the number infinity exists. We use it in math all the time. But we don't know its nature. What the hell is that thing, right? Let us now let us speak now according to natural lights. If there is a God, he is infinitely incomprehensible, since having neither parts nor limits, he has no affinity with us. Remember what Descartes said in his meditations. Two substances exist, right? There is mental stuff and then there's physical stuff, mind and the body, and somehow these are unified in the human being. Well, a prominent uh, princess, I believe at the time, Elizabeth of Bohemia, ended up writing to Descartes after reading his meditations and asked him a very important question. How are these things unified in the human being? If there is a mental substance that makes us up and it is non-physical, how can it interact with the physical? How can the mind move the body if they can't touch, right? If you have a non-physical thing and a physical thing. Well, a similar idea is being invoked here. God is infinitely incomprehensible to us, Pascal is saying, because we can't, 
like see or touch God, right? If God has no parts and no limits, how could a finite creature like ourselves interact with or grasp the infinite in the ways that are important for perhaps scientific knowledge and analysis, right? We are incapable, therefore, of knowing either what he is or if he is. That being so, who will dare undertake to decide this question? Not we, who have no affinity with him. Who then can blame the Christians for not being able to give reasons for their belief, professing as they do a religion which they cannot explain by reason? They declare, when expounding to the world, that it is foolishness, stultitum, stultitium, sorry, and then you complain that they do not prove it. If they proved it, they would give the lie to their own worlds. It is in lacking proofs that they do not lack sense. Yes, but while this is an excuse for those who offer it as such and frees them from the blame from not basing their beliefs upon reason, it does not excuse those who accept what they say. Well, let us examine this point of view and declare. Either God exists or he does not. To which view shall we incline? Which one should we take up? Which one should we believe in? Reason cannot decide for us one way or the other. We are separated by an infinite gulf. At the extremity of this infinite distance, a game is in progress. Ooh, a game. Where either heads or tails may turn up. What will you wager? According to reason, you cannot bet either way. According to reason, you can defend neither proposition. Okay, so let's say somebody comes up to you. And they're like, okay, you have to bet your whole life savings. Are you going to bet that God exists or that God does not exist? Or you could take the third way out and not bet at all. What's the reasonable thing to do? That's what a lot of people would say, right? Like, oh, I can't know that. Why the hell would I, you know, put my life savings down on one thing or the other? Like, I don't have any proof for God, but yet science can't disprove God, right? So the reasonable thing would be to not bet. But, as we'll see, according to Pascal, not betting is not an option in your life. So let's continue on. So do not attribute error to those who have made a choice, for you know nothing about it. No, I will not blame them for having made this choice, but for having made one at all. For since he who calls heads and he who calls tails are equally at fault. Both are in the wrong. The right thing is to not wager at all. Yes, Pascal says, but a bet must be laid. There is no option. You have joined the game. Which will you choose then? Since a choice has to be made, let us see which is of least moment to you. You have two things to lose, the true and the good, and two things to wager, your reason and your will, your knowledge and your happiness. Your nature has two things to shun, error and unhappiness. Your reason suffers no more violence in choosing one rather than another, since you must of necessity make a choice. That is one point cleared up. But what about your happiness? Let us weigh the gain and loss involved in wagering that God exists. Let us estimate these two probabilities. If you win, you win all. If you lose, you lose nothing. Wager then, without hesitation, that he does exist. Do you see what he is saying there? You find yourself existing on this earth with no proof of God. You have people on either side of you 
telling you, God does not exist, that's a fairy tale, don't be stupid, be reasonable. And then you have people on the other side saying, don't you care what happens to you after you die? God does exist, and you are going to be judged for how you live your life. Do you want to burn in hell for all eternity? You cannot not choose. You exist. And so if God exists, presumably, if the religions are right, something's going to happen to you when you die. And people have all kinds of ideas about that. So you are in the game. You're a part of it. You have to make a choice. But reason cannot point you definitively in one to one path or the other. Have you ever meditated on this? Is this not a terrifying proposition to you? Perhaps it's not scary because you have no belief in God. Right? If you don't think God exists, why would you worry about this at all? Well, let's continue reading and see what he says. That is all very fine. Yes, I must wager, but maybe I'm wagering too much. Let us see. Since there is an equal risk of winning and of losing, if you had only two lives to win, you might still wager. But if there were three lives to win, you would still have to play, since you are under the necessity of playing. And being thus obliged to play, you would be imprudent not to risk your life to win three in a game where there is an equal chance of winning and losing. But there is an eternity of life and happiness at stake. That being so, if there were an infinity of chances of which only one was in your favor, you would still do right to stake one to win two. And you would act unwisely in refusing to play one life against three in a game where you had only one chance out of an infinite number. If there were an infinity of an infinitely happy life to win, but here there is an infinity of infinitely happy life to win, one chance of winning against a finite number of chances of losing. And what you stake is finite. That removes all doubt as to choice. Wherever the infinite is, and there is not an infinity of chances of loss against the chance of winning, there are no two ways about it. All must be given to this choice. And so when a man is obliged to play, as we all are, Pascal thinks, he must renounce reason to preserve his life rather than risk it for infinite gain, which is just as likely to occur as loss of nothing. For it is no use alleging the uncertainty of winning and the certainty of risk, or to say that the infinite distance between the certainty of what one risks and the uncertainty of what one will win equals that between the finite good, which one certainly risks, and the infinite, which is uncertain. That is not so. Every player risks a certainty to win an uncertainty. And yet he risks a finite certainty to win a finite uncertainty without offending reason. There is no infinite distance between the certainty risked and the uncertainty of the gain. It is not true. There is indeed infinity between the certainty of winning and the certainty of losing. But the uncertainty of winning is proportionate to the certainty of what is risked according to the proportion of the chances of gain and loss. Hence, if there are many risks on one side as on the other, the right course is to play even, and the certainty of the risk is equal to the uncertainty of the gain. So far are they from being infinitely distant. Thus our proposition is of infinite force. When there is the infinite at stake in a game where there are equal chances of winning and losing, but the infinite to gain. This is conclusive. And if men are capable of truth at all, there it is. So you probably didn't follow exactly what he said, but let's walk through it. Because what he proposes is a very rational mathematical argument 
for betting on the existence of God. If you know anything about rationality calculus, you'll see this is an argument based on reason, and it is fairly convincing. It's almost as if in, this, in these aphorisms, he's not only trying to provide an argument for others to believe in God, but he's trying to assure himself. He's struggling, no doubt, with doubts of faith, with doubts in God's existence. He too would like assurance, right? We all want assurances and guarantees. We don't want to live a life of uncertainty and insecurity. We want to know what's true. We want to know what's false. We want to know how we're supposed to live. Definitively. With a proof, please. But the problem is, the most important questions in life don't have easy answers like that. There is no guarantee that you're going to survive until tomorrow. There's no guarantee you're going to succeed and fulfill your dreams. Does an afterlife exist? Does anybody know? A lot of people claim to know, right? Does God exist? What the hell are we supposed to be doing in our lives? How do we obtain happiness and fulfillment? These are all questions that thinkers have been wrestling with for thousands of years. And if you've never thought through these questions before, well, you have done a marvelous job of insulating yourself from discomfort. But that's not what philosophy is about. Philosophy is about seeking the truth and asking questions. That's what we're doing in this class. That's what Pascal is trying to do here. And he discovers that, okay, it looks like there is no proof for the existence of God. I don't know for sure that there's an afterlife. I don't know for sure that there's a heaven or hell. I can't give you a mathematical theorem for that. But he thinks that he can give us, or perhaps himself, good enough reason to bet that God exists, to live and act as if God exists. It was contained in those aforementioned passages. And I'm going to present a little helpful table for you to understand what he's saying here in a moment. Mountains of evidence lie on either side. Or maybe you think one side is a molehill. I don't know. If you want evidence for God, read apologetics, read the mystics. Perhaps you know somebody in your personal life who has said, I've had a personal experience, a religious experience, a spiritual experience, and my life has been changed. I'm not sure if any of you who have had such an experience, but if you do, it will be incredibly convincing, probably. And yet it seems that the entirety of what we would classify as reasonable human knowledge doesn't support the existence of God. How many mainstream scientists and intellectuals today believe in God? There is no God detector, right? We can't see him up in space with our telescopes. If the scientists are to be believed that the contemporary scientific view is correct, it seems we don't need God's existence to explain how any of this works, right? We could just talk about natural laws physical, chemical reactions, all of that stuff. But for many people, despite these arguments, 
in reasons and evidence. This is still a very real question, a live issue. Because when it comes to matters of how we are supposed to live and what we are, is going to happen to us after we die, it seems to be a, a feature of humanity to think about and be a little bit fixated on these things, at least sometimes. And so the question confronts us as well. In this way, we can say Pascal's philosophy is similar to that of a very important Christian philosopher who came after him, Soren Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard argued that Nobody has an objectively justifiable basis for making a claim on the existence of God. He was wrestling with a very similar problem. And what he noticed was, look, people are going to say, well, I don't believe in God because I'm reasonable. And some people are going to say, I believe in God because I have faith. And he says... How are you supposed to know which one of those to live according to? How do you know living according to reason is right? How do you know living according to faith is right? Neither of these paths are all to objectively, ultimately justifiable. We have to make a free, autonomous choice about what to put our faith in, right? Athens or Jerusalem, reason or faith, logic or intuition, whatever you want to call it. And he encourages others to make the leap of faith, to choose the option of the Christian life. And this was somebody who wrestled very strongly with this question. Somebody who suffered through it deeply. Who even says, autobiographically, I struggle making the leap. I am not sure if I have met a knight of faith in my life, someone who has taken that leap. Who has gone through the motion of what he calls infinite resignation, accepted the world as it is without trying to change, control, or grasp it, and then place their trust and hope in God, thereby regaining the world in some sense. And so here are what the odds look like. We are all faced with this question. Do I live as if God exists? Do I act as if God exists? Do I believe that God exists? Should I do that? We're all faced with this question. Well, let's draw out a little helpful table. If you were a betting person, and you are a betting person, you're betting your existence as you live on this question, whether you like it or not, according to Pascal, there are a few options available to you, right? You can either believe that God exists, or you don't believe that he exists. And then God either doesn't exist or he does exist. Let's walk through how you should bet, the wager you should make. According to Pascal, you should bet that God exists. You should live and act that way. Why? Well, he gives the following explanation. Let's say that you believe that God exists. But he doesn't actually exist. What have you gained by living a Christian life? Anything? Nodding? Yeah, well, maybe what have you gained? You gained peace, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Maybe some peace, security, anything else? 
Right. You've lived a moral life. Maybe you have some existential peace, right? You're not dreading your inevitable death. <laughs> Maybe. Well, what have you lost? Well, you've given up on some fun, right? Look at all the drugs and alcohol and sex you could have had. Right? All the music you could have listened to. All the material comforts you could have engaged in. Which are often denied by a lot of denominations of Christianity. They would encourage a more ascetic lifestyle. So, your gain is finite. Your loss is finite. Depending on how you feel about these things, oh, maybe you think uh, that you lose more than you gain. But if you care about, I don't know, being uh, moral according to the Christian sense, maybe you think if you lived like this, you would gain more than you lose. I don't know. Okay, let's say you don't believe that God exists and he doesn't exist. What have you gained? If you live that kind of life. It's pretty straightforward. Most of the stuff is going to be repeated in these boxes. <laughs> yeah. You don't think you've gained anything? Well, how about this? You get to have more fun. You get to do more drugs, have more orgies, right? Go clubbing, kiss random people, I don't know. People have fun doing that, right? They spend their lives doing that. And so you might say, well, look, yeah, I get to like do the cocaine and the molly, and it's great. Maybe I wasn't the best person, but I probably wasn't a complete asshole, right? Okay, so compared to that box, maybe you had more fun, uh, but you weren't as uh, straight-laced. That is supposing God doesn't exist. What if God actually exists? Think about that now. If God actually exists, the Christian God, and you believe and act as if he exists, what have you gained? Yeah, a sense of hope and uh, security, right? But what's the thing that a lot of people care about? What's going to happen to believers after they die, if God exists? And what is heaven like? Paradise? Infinite comfort and peace and love and hope? This is how it's painted, right? If you believe in God and he does exist... Boom. Infinite gain. Infinite gain for eternity in heaven with him. And you live a moral life on earth. Yes, you lose out on some fun. And maybe think you look, people think you look stupid. Right? Atheists are going to look at you and say, 80 IQ believer. Right? But what does that matter when you have infinite happiness to gain? Compare that to the next box. God does exist and you don't believe in him. What do you have to lose? You're smiling. Do you have an idea? And what is hell like? 
eternal damnation, suffering, despair, pain, you lose everything. Infinite loss. Infinite misery, wretchedness. This is the picture that Pascal is painting for us. Now if you do the calculus here, what is the rational way to live? This column or this column? He's going to say, if you know anything about how numbers and infinity work, about how reason works, this is how you should live. This is how you should bet. Why? If God doesn't exist, finite loss. If God does exist, infinite gain. If God doesn't exist, eh, finite gain. If God does exist, infinite loss and pain and suffering for forever. So the rational thing to do is to bet on God's existence. You can't know, scientifically, you can't prove that God exists. Perhaps you'll always have doubts and questions, but that is the rational action. That is the decision that you should make. It's terrifying, isn't it? Does any of us, do we have certainty that the Christian worldview is true? I don't think any Christian would say they have certainty. Right? Even the most faithful saints have had doubts in their lives. But are you willing to bet your life and eternal fate on God not existing? Well, that is something you're going to have to move through yourself. That's a question you're going to have to ask. And look, you can say, well, I don't care about this. You know, it doesn't really matter. I don't, I don't really want to think about it. What's going to happen to you if God does exist? You will be damned according to the Christians. So you, you are a member of the game. You cannot escape it. You have to make a bet. What bet are you going to make? Not making a choice is still making a choice. According to Pascal, it's making the wrong one. <clears throat> that is what he is exploring and wrestling with in these passages. Is exactly this. How are we supposed to live? What should we bet on? Should we believe in God? Now I'll finish up here with just reading the rest of what Pascal has to say, and then we can talk about this. From the last paragraph he concluded, This is conclusive, and if men are capable of truth at all, there it is. Make the choice to bet on infinite gain. I agree. I admit it. But is there no way of getting a look behind the scenes? Yes, scripture and the rest. Quite. But my, hand, my hands are tied and my mouth is gagged. I am forced to wager and I am not free. No one frees me from these bonds. And I am so made that I cannot believe. What then do you wish me to do? That is true. But understand at least that your ability to believe is the result of your passions. For although reason inclines you to believe, you cannot do so. Maybe some of you feel like this. Maybe you are convinced by this argument, but you just can't. You're like, I just don't have that faith. I don't have that belief. 
Try, therefore, he says, to convince yourself, not by piling up proofs of God, but by subduing your passions. You desire to attain faith, but do not know the way. You would like to cure yourself of unbelief, and you ask for remedies. Learn of those who were bound and gagged like you, and who now stake all they possess. Look to the church fathers, look to the saints, look to the heroes of the Bible, perhaps. They are men who know the road you desire to follow, and who have been cured of a sickness of which you desire to be cured. Follow the way by which they set out, acting as if they already believed, taking holy water, having masses said, etc. Even this will naturally cause you to believe and bunt your cleverness. But that is what I fear. Why? What have you to lose? But to show that such practices lead you to believe, it is those things which will curtail your passions which are your main obstacles. Now to what harm will you come by making this choice? You will be faithful, honest, humble, grateful, generous, a sincere friend, truthful. Certainly you will not enjoy these pernicious delights, glory, and luxury. But will you, will you not experience others? I tell you, you will thereby profit in this life. And at every step you take along this road, you will see so great an assurance of gain and so little in what you risk that you will come to recognize your stake to have been laid for something certain, infinite, which has cost you nothing. Oh, your discourse delights me, carries me away. If it pleases you and appears convincing, know it has been uttered by a man who has knelt both before and after its delivery, in prayer to that being, infinite and without parts, before whom he submits all that is his, begging him to subject himself all that is yours, for your own good and for his glory. And thus strength is made consistent with lowliness. So according to Pascal, he has made his bet. And he has decided along the path that he is encouraging others to follow as well. So what do you think about all this? What thoughts and feelings are springing up for you? Sure, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, I think Pascal would actually agree with you. And I think he would say, this is just to get your foot in the door. And then you go to church, you read the Bible, you partake of the sacraments, and generally, over time, slowly, uh, you will cultivate real faith. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I think mean, that makes sense. Do you agree with him? I do. I think like getting your foot in the door is a better way to put it than like just guaranteeing yourself the better odds by just believing because of the odds. Right. It seems a little, I don't know, tricksy or insincere perhaps. Right. Okay. What do the rest of you think? Are you convinced? Yeah? I mean, I agree with what he was saying, but I, what he's, Pascal said, it makes sense, I guess. But ultimately, like you said, it's not good to just do it for the odds and fear of consequences. Okay. So you have to have a genuine belief. Okay. I'm guessing probably a few of you also feel like that. Yeah? I really like the first half. Wager itself. 
Yeah. Really hypocritical with that, and I also think it's kind of stupid. <gasps> or at the very least, it's way more skewed than he's presenting it as. Because, like, you know, what if you believe in God and then you go to, like, the Egyptian underworld? Or what if you go to, like, uh, Jewish heaven? Or, like, what if Broco's Basilisk, like, tur- tortures you for eternity? Like, doing this as a God exists or God doesn't exist is completely ignoring not only every other religion, but every other possibility. And I feel like it kind of, his whole idea of trying to mathematically justify faith completely contradicts with the first portion of his essay. Ah, yeah, yeah. I don't think he would, uh, similar to what we said about some of the other questions and comments here, um, I think he sees the wager as a tool um, as a description, you might say, of our existential state. But I don't think I don't think he thinks it's like ultimately a proof of anything, you know. So I think he might agree with some of your sentiments. I think he would say there is no mathematical proof or argument for God's existence. Faith is not something they maybe can even be justified by reason. Yes. But the other questions you brought up are also good because those are the common objections to this thought experiment or this idea that Pascal has written about. How do we know the Christian story is the right one? Maybe the Babylonian religion is the right one. Maybe the Egyptian esoteric views are the right ones. Maybe we should be worshipping Ra. Or Eastern deities. Krishna. Or Brahma. Brahma. Is Pascal kind of sliding in a presupposition that the Christian worldview is the right one? Let's say you accept what he has to say. You could always just say then also, well, you know, who exactly is this God that we're betting on? Is it the one that is described in the Bible? This Father, Son, Holy Spirit union guy? There have been other views about who God is and what they are like. Maybe God is nature. Maybe we should all be pantheists. Maybe there is no God, but there may be a God in the future in the terms of artificial intelligence, and that's what we should care about. Right? Not whether there is a, some spiritual thing up there, but a dangerous, uh, super intelligent computer thing. Yeah, these are real questions and worries that you might have. That you might think undermines the kind of evidence or arguments that Pascal is giving us here. Another question you might ask is, okay, well, let's just accept the wager at face value. What does that really mean? If you ask different denominations of Christianity, they will tell you different things about what it means to believe that God exists. Some Christians are going to say, You have to have been confirmed. You have to have been baptized. You have to have the proper belief, this proper mental state. Others will say, no, it has nothing to do with beliefs, as in confidences and propositions. It has to do with your heart posture. And so I think everybody who shows love is going to go to heaven. Right? Yeah, what does it mean to believe properly? That's something we're going to want to figure out if 
you know, we're going to bet that there's a heaven and a hell and there's a God because we're going to want to know how we're supposed to live, right? How are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to feel? What are we supposed to think if we're going to, you know, make the right bet? These are very real questions. And maybe you'll think, well, I actually do believe in the Christian God, but I don't think he's actually going to send anybody to hell. So I'm not really worried about this at all. Right? Or maybe the God that does exist, why would they care about what we believe? They could just snap their fingers and, woo, there we go, we're in eternal paradise forever. Why would they care, why would they care what we're doing down here? So I don't know, does, do any of those questions resonate with you? Do they pop up for you? Yeah. Yeah. So would would you also believe in repentance then? If somebody does genuinely turn away from their sins, there's still the possibility that they can be saved? Sure. Yeah, I think a lot of a Christ- Christians would agree, right? A lot of them might say, you can still be with God even if you murdered somebody. But it requires a real transformation, right? Not a fake apology or whatever. And to some, that is a heinous doctrine. Somebody who's very close to me think that is repugnant And they do not want to worship a God who would accept someone who is terrible and evil like that. But give me your closing thoughts on this. So you think there are kind of multiple paths to paradise, perhaps. If you have love, if you do good things, if you, maybe if you, you know, you think a God exists and you try to live your life according to what they want. Yeah, they're not going to judge you for believing in like something kind of differently than a different religion. Okay. Yeah, so you're providing some, some context on, I guess, two and three there. Right? You're thinking, well, you don't have to live the, the very strict puritanical Christian lifestyle to make it into paradise. And a lot of people would agree with you probably. Anybody have any closing thoughts, opinions, questions? Okay. Well then, I'll let you get to your weekend. Talk with this. Talk to other people about this, rather. I think this is a question that a lot of people wrestle with in their lives. It may be one you're wrestling with right now. In that case, my heart goes out to you. Because life is confusing and hard. (laughs) 
All right, thank you. I will see you next week.